Welcome back to our next online lecture and uh, for Biology 1217. Just a couple things here as we uh, get going today. Uh, let's take a look at the syllabus here to start with. And just want to point out a couple of things as we get going this week of February uh, the 11th. And uh, with, oops, and that should have, there we go, February 11th. Uh, let me back up a page here. There we are. We will be having our bone lab exam uh, in lab on Wednesday and Thursday. So make sure you're preparing yourself for that, uh, that bone lab exam again on Wednesday and Thursday of this week um, on the 13th and the 14th. Today we're going to look at, uh, finish up more with epithelial tissue and look forward to dealing with uh, muscle and connective tissue here as we go uh, on our way through the tissues of the human body. So uh, we had left off dealing with the uh, epithelial tissue and mentioned just kind of going back and reviewing a little bit, that as we classify epithelial tissue, we classify it based on cell shape, which there are squamous shapes, which are flat, cuboidal shapes, which are, you know, basically cubed, and then column shapes, which are more tall and rectangular. And then also the layering, which was simple, which was one layer, versus stratified, which was two or more layers of cells. So uh, we're going to take a look at that as we go, as we continue on. And we left off talking about the simple columnar epithelial cells of microvilli found in the digestive tract in the stomach and the intestines. And what we're going to do uh, today is take a look at some other types here of epithelial tissue. And uh, to start with today, let's, uh, this would be probably our fourth specific type of tissue. And here we go. Uh, let's take a look at the pseudostratified ciliated <coughs> columnar epithelial tissue. All right, and with the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, uh, this is tissue that looks like multiple layers, but it's actually one. Now let me show you, this is on page 122 of the text. I want to show you what this looks like in a photomicrograph form. And what you have uh, with this specific type of tissue, it has just one layer of cells. Let me zoom in a little bit. Oops, here we go. On this, it's one layer of cells. They all reach the basement membrane, all reach the free surface. So it's a single layer. They differ in heights um, and with not some, reach, some not reaching this, the free surface, but all reaching the basement membrane. And what happens is some of them contain goblet cells that secrete mucus. And here you can see the cilia on the top. Looks like almost hairs. Again, this is greatly blown up. But um, what happens with this type of epithelial tissue, uh, this type is found oftentimes with, uh, with goblet cells. And goblet cells are cells that secrete mucus. And uh, with those uh, goblet cells and the cilia, um, these are the types of, this type of tissue lines the trachea and the upper respiratory tract. And what this works as, as far as the function, it helps to filter the air uh, that we breathe. And it, this mucus and the cilia, what they do is they trap uh, debris, dust and spores, uh, hairs, things like that, and they trap debris in the air and move it to the pharynx, at which point then you have an opportunity to either swallow or spit and clean out basically your respiratory tract. But that's what's referred to as a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. Okay. Then a um, couple other types here. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the stratified squamous because uh, that's a very, very interesting uh, type of tissue. And I think we've already actually dealt with um, keratinized versus non-keratinized, so I want to skip that. Uh, but let's go to transitional. Transitional epithelium. E again stands for epithelium. 
Now, let me ask Josh here in the studio. Josh, when you're in transition, what's that mean is happening? Exactly. So you're, you're changing, right? So it's like between jobs or between cities as far as an actual physical move. But in transitional, what's happening is the cells are frequently changing shape. And they'll go from a cube-shaped to a squamous shape and then back to a cube shape. Um, so the cells are continually in a, in a state of kind of flux in a sense. It looks like stratified cuboidal or stratified squamous, but they're changing. And, and the function of this tissue is this. Uh, this tissue is uh, capable of stretching, or sometimes this is referred to as distension. It's capable of expanding uh, the size of the actual organ. And this allows for storage. And a good example of this is where it's located is in your urinary bladder. Because your bladder has to fill, um, and uh, that allows that to, to fill with urine. So it stretches. So your bladder's here. As it fills, the cells get flattened out. And then as you urinate, they compress back down because there's no more pressure on them. So um, that's what's where, you, where you find this transitional epithelium uh, in the human body. Okay. Now, we've dealt with uh, stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized and keratinized and transitional. So we've kind of gotten through that uh, part that I wanted to get through as far as the epithelial tissues. So what I want to do today is I want to move on to the... Uh, muscle tissue uh, in the human body. Now, in looking at muscle tissue, uh, let's go back and just review a couple things here with muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is non-mitotic. That means uh, the cells don't divide anymore in your body. Um, however, they are capable of hypertrophy, and hypertrophy is another term for cell enlargement. So the cell can enlarge. It can go from, you know, a skeletal muscle cell can go from so big to much bigger, and we've enlarged that. It's, again, we still have one cell, small cell, big cell. Uh, one cell, but it's gotten bigger. And Josh, again, just in review, do you know what, what causes hypertrophy of muscles? Uh, exercise. exercise. You know, if you want to get bigger biceps, you lift weights. Um, another thing that will cause this uh, process of hypertrophy is hormonal changes like testosterone. You know, when uh, Boys are going through puberty, right? You take an 8th eight, eight or 9th eight, eight grade boy and compare him to 11th and 12th grade boy, and they might not even lift a lot of weights, but their muscles get bigger. Um, that's the influence of testosterone on the body and growth hormone. Testosterone and growth hormone both promote this process uh, of hypertrophy. And essentially in hypertrophy, what's enlarging is within muscle tissue, do you know, um, chemically, Josh, do you know what, what is muscle made out of? It's made out of protein. And so to do this, there has to be ample protein in the diet. So ample amounts of amino acids, whether that be from you know kidney beans or chicken or turkey or beef or wherever it might be, but ample protein uh, to produce that effect. Now, the other thing I want to mention that can happen to this tissue is atrophy. And think of atrophy as cell shrinkage. So you have a cell that's big like this, and then it ends up like this, okay? All right, just the opposite of hypertrophy is atrophy. And again, Josh, do you know what causes atrophy? Exactly, disuse, uh, disease, and aging, right? If you don't use it, you'll lose it. I mean, you, hear, you probably hear coaches use that phrase frequently that if you want to maintain muscle tissue, you have to exercise. You've got to be out there. You've got to lift weights and so forth. Um, disease. And I'll give you an example. Um, 
with the disease, uh, polio. When polio would strike, it would hit the, the nerves, and the nerves wouldn't innervate the muscles anymore. Without nerve innervation, the muscle just basically atrophies and wastes away. Um, aging, you know, if you look at your grandfathers, uh, a lot of times they've lost a lot of muscle tissue compared to when they have 20, or 20 years of age. So uh, those can happen. Now, the thing I want to mention, too, with uh, muscle tissue, it's got some specific characteristics to it. Uh, the first characteristic I want to mention is that it is excitable. And do you know, Josh, what excites muscle tissue? Um, it gets excited by nervous stimulation. Uh, there, the neurons fire, the motor neurons fire, and that will stimulate the muscle to contract. Okay. A second thing is that muscles are contractile. And contractility means that they shorten. They shorten. And thirdly, um, so they're excitable, they're contractile. Um, they're also extensible. You can stretch them out. You know, most of us have stretched muscle tissue out. When you warm up, you do your stretches before you run or play soccer or whatever it might be that you do. Um, so they've got some unique characteristics uh, about them. Now, with the uh, muscle tissue in the, the human body, uh, these are just some of the, the characteristics. And inside each muscle tissue, there are what are referred to as myofilaments. And myofilaments, these are proteins, which are primarily made up of what's called actin, and myosin, actin and myosin uh, filaments. And those are what compose or the muscle tissue is composed of. Now, there's three specific types of muscle tissue that we're going to cover here today as we take a more in-depth look at muscle tissue. And uh, the first type we're going to look at is skeletal muscle tissue. Now, uh, Josh, do you know where would, do you know why we call it skeletal muscle tissue? Exactly, it manipulates the bones of the skeleton. So let's take a look at the specific types. Of muscle tissue. The very first one. Is skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle. Is oftentimes attached to the bones. And it's kind of unique in that uh, with skeletal muscle, it's made up of long uh, cylindrical fibers, long cylindrical fibers, which are striated and they're multinucleated. So let me give you an example of how this appears in, uh, in actual tissue that's been stained. This is on page um, 138. And you can see these par long parallel cylinders. Nuclei out here, these little dashes, and it's striated. The striated means it's kind of it's banded, essentially. Uh, when we talk about striations, it's got these bands to it. And um, with this type, Again, this, uh, some examples would be like your biceps brachii, gluteus maximus. You know, there's, there's well over 500, oops, gluteus maximus. There's over 500 skeletal muscles in your body. We're not going to list them all. But, and Josh, is this voluntary or involuntary? It is voluntary. Now, later on, we're going to get into this. I'm just going to give you a little preview really quickly here. There are subtypes of skeletal muscle. And let me just uh, jump ahead for just a moment here, but let me give you an example. Um, Josh, do you know, if you go into the grocery store, what, what colors does the meat come in that you buy, that you can purchase? Red, 
what else? White and pink, right? Red, white, and pink. And what happens is this. The, the subtypes of skeletal muscle, oftentimes what happens is they vary based on, on blood flow and amount of myoglobin, okay? Very based on blood flow and amount of myoglobin. So you have red muscle tissue. You have white muscle tissue. And there's also kind of a hybrid there of pink, red, white, and pink. And the red has a lot of blood flow in it, and it has a lot of myoglobin in it. And just kind of giving a quick preview, and this is just a very general overview right now. But Josh, let me ask you this. Do you know um, what, what kind of meat is it that you can go to the grocery store and it's always white when you buy it? What, what's an example of white meat? Chicken. What part of the chicken? Breast, okay. So a good example of white muscle would be chicken breast. A um, good example of red muscle, and Josh, let me ask you this question. You know, uh, what's, our, what's the animal that represents the city of Rochester? The goose, exactly. And if you ever, I don't know if you've ever eaten goose, but the breast on a goose is red. So when you cook it, it cooks up as dark meat, whereas a chicken breast cooks up as white meat. Now, Josh, sticking with me here on this, do you know if it's red, which is what a goose breast is composed of, red muscle, that means it has a lot of blood flow and a lot of myoglobin. What does that mean to its ability to uh, sustain muscle contractions as far as its endurance? Exactly. And if it's red, it has great endurance. If it's white, that means less blood flow, less myoglobin. And do you know what does that mean to the endurance then? Yeah, very little endurance. Now, Josh, you're from Preston, kind of a rural area. So you've seen chickens, I suppose, on a farm or something like that. Do you know, can chickens fly? Yeah, so, the, right, so they can, chickens can fly. I've raised chickens, but how far can they fly? Yeah, maybe 15 feet, if that. So chickens um, have very uh, short burst ability to fly very far. And that's based on the fact that they don't have the muscle tissue to do it, okay? Now, let me ask you this, Josh. On these, the geese that are fertilizing the grounds here at RCTC, um, do you know how far can they fly? Do you think they can make it to Mexico? Um, what if they stop periodically? Yeah, they could make it to Mexico, right? Do you think they can fly out to Plainview from RCTC without stopping? They can. So the geese that we have can fly over the Mississippi River and come back to Rochester within a day. Um, so they have a lot of endurance. Now, one thing you will never see, ever, you will never see flocks of chickens uh, flying over the Rochester skyline like you do the geese, uh, because they're different muscle tissue. It's different skeletal muscle tissue, all right? But uh, we'll get into that in more detail in a later unit, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea with that. Uh, the second type of skeletal, or excuse me, second type of muscle tissue is what's referred to as cardiac muscle, M for muscle. And Josh, where would this be found? in the heart. This is what makes up your heart. And this is also striated. The difference between it and skeletal muscle, this is branching. It inter intersects with each other. Um, and it has within it special intercalated discs. It's an actually anatomical structure that does help a little bit with propagation of the impulse. So the unit, the heart beats as one unit in unison, but the cardiac muscle tissue. And uh, Josh, is this 
Involuntary or voluntary? Involuntary, exactly. You cannot control the rate at which your heart beats. I mean, in the sense that you can't just say, you know, um, let's raise the heart rate up to 150. You know, you can do that with exercise. Um, likewise, you just can't stop the heart from beating either. Um, you, you need, you know, it's it's an involuntary organ. Now, it is also capable of this, of hypertrophy and atrophy. Now, do you know, Josh, let me ask you this. What would cause hypertrophy of your heart? Remember, it's going to get thicker. And what causes this is aerobic exercise. So running, biking, swimming, playing basketball, you know, running, running doing some type of activity to get the heart rate up for a period of time. And so if you're going to go out, and let's say you're an exerciser, and you go out and you run four or five days a week or three days a week, and you do it for a half hour, 45 minutes each time, your heart gets stronger. It goes through hypertrophy. This is a good thing. And when the heart goes through hypertrophy, um, it will thicken the muscle. That will give you an increased stroke volume which means you're going to get more blood pumped out per beat. And that's an excellent thing to have happen. Uh, exercise strengthens the heart, aerobic exercise. Atrophy, again, um, is from being uh, sedentary. You know, if you're not doing anything, the heart gets weaker. Um, and also, what will cause atrophy, is, besides being sedentary, is getting older. Oftentimes, as we age. Now, one thing you can do is, you know, make sure you're physically active. That helps to, to maintain uh, cardiac muscle in the wall of the heart. Now, remember too, with this, it's not mitotic. So, Josh, if somebody has a heart attack and they damage, you know, 10% of the heart and they survive that, do you know will they regrow the heart tissue that was damaged, Josh? They will not. Okay. So again, we want to keep our heart in good shape because it's the only heart we're probably ever going to have. It's, you know, I know there are some heart transplants that are done, but it's not something you want to count on. So it's important to, to maintain good, uh, good heart health. Third type of muscle is smooth muscle. Smooth muscle. There we go. And smooth muscle is non-striated. No striations. Okay, at all. Um, spindle shaped cells and they form these sheets. Now, I want to show you, and this is kind of a bad diagram of it, I think, um, but here's the down here at the bottom. This is on the bottom, page 139. When I say spindle, it has kind of, it's almost like a squamous cell. Uh, epithelial cell. No striations to it. They're all knit in there very tightly. And um, what happens with this type of muscle is you find this uh, in areas like your bronchioles, your stomach, um, your intestines, and in artery walls, artery and veins. Um, so you find it in hollow organs. And again, it's there to um, propel things along, basically. It's involved with propulsion. Uh, so it propels the food through your stomach, your intestines, blood through the arteries and veins, uh, and so forth. Now, with this, uh, Josh, voluntary or involuntary? That is involuntary. You don't have control over this, all right? You know, the example I give you is this. Is let's say you're constipated, right? If you're constipated, you can't think your way out of constipation. You just can't, you know, say, that's it. I'm going to the bathroom and going to take care of business right now and have it be done. You know, it, it's, it's an involuntary type muscle. Likewise, if you have somebody who has asthma, right, and the, the bronchioles are constricting down, getting smaller, um, you just can't tell an athlete, you know, six, sixth grade soccer player, just think bronchodilation will go away. You know, they've got to get their inhaler. So again, this is an involuntary type muscle. Now, this muscle is also capable of hypertrophy and atrophy. And hypertrophy means it gets stronger and you maintain the strength of it. Now, with this, let me just do this. 
Um, what causes it to, to be with, with, as far as hypertrophy and keeps the strength up, again, is just that if you're active, if you do exercise, this helps to maintain the smooth muscle. But what happens is oftentimes as we age and we slow down as far as less activity, physical activity, the, the smooth muscle oftentimes will atrophy. Now, Josh, I'm going to stick with you here. If, if the smooth muscle atrophies, let's say leading to my rectum and colon, right, through my digestive tract, uh, what's that going to mean then? What does that oftentimes result in? Do you know? You got it. Okay. Now, some of you may have older relatives, either at home or in a nursing home, wherever. They, they suffer chronic constipation, and oftentimes it doesn't get better. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially residents in a nursing home, they might be constipated for a decade or more. And if you think about it, obviously there's activity as assistants and there's physical therapists who work with residents, but a lot of times in a nursing home they're very sedentary. And even people who are at home and not in a nursing home, a lot of times they watch TV, they're not very active. It's, it's good to get up and to walk and to move because that helps to maintain this. So, you know, if you've been constipated, you know what I'm talking about. It's absolutely uh, a, a very difficult thing to deal with, okay, if you're constipated uh, on a frequent basis. So again, um, smooth muscle type there. Now, I want to get started today uh, with connective tissue. And uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about connective tissue, but we've covered the epithelial and the muscle tissue, and we're going to get a start here on the connective tissue that makes up the human body. So let me switch pages here, and we're going to get going with connective tissue, CT. Okay. And CT, just as some general things about it, it is by far the most abundant uh, tissue type in the human body. You have more connective tissue than you do muscle, nervous, uh, or epithelial. Um, now, with it, there are uh, four main classes. And before I get into that, let me just put it. It's extremely variable. It's, it's oops, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. It's quite variable. And when I say that, it's quite variable. It's based on a couple of things. Um, the, the types of cells, matrix, and um, let's just put types of cells in matrix. So let me go out with this matrix part first. Matrix, by definition, is defined as the extracellular material, um, the extracellular stuff, so to speak, what's outside the cell. And with the extracellular material, um, there's different parts that make that up, but the extracellular material is things like uh, there's three types of matrix. One is solid. And Josh, you know, what's one of the most solid things that makes up your body? Bone, exactly. So we take a look at bone. Bone is made up of hydroxy apatite crystals. And that's calcium and phosphorus and some other things. But it's very, very hard, you know, and you've seen those in lab, very, very hard structures. Then there is uh, solid, the opposite of solid would be a liquid matrix. And, you know, what um, bodily tissue is liquid? Do you know, Josh? Blood, exactly. And between the cells, you have water. Water's liquid in this case. Um, so solid, liquid, and the third type is a semi-solid. And a semi-solid, to give you an example, is cartilage. Uh, cartilage has uh, chondroitin in it with um, fibers in that chondroitin. So it's a semi-solid. So again, what's outside of the cells, the matrix, can vary quite a bit from solid, liquid, to semi-solid. 
So a lot of variability in this type of tissue. Then as far as the types of cells that you have, um, let me just give you an example of, of cell types that we have. Um, there are a variety of different types of cells that make up the different types of connective tissues. Um, you may have osteocytes. And do you know, uh, Josh, what's, what's the term osteo refer to? Um, bone, exactly. So there are bone cells. There are also adipocytes. And do you know what adipose is, Josh? That is fat. Third one, um, red blood cells, right? Um, chondrocytes, which are found in cartilage. Those are cartilage cells, all right? You also have cells like fibroblasts. So a, a lot of variability. A fibroblast is a fiber producing cell, fiber producing cell. And let me just uh, go into this in a little bit of detail, but I'm not going to list all the cell types, but there's a lot of them. Um, and they vary a lot as far as what they look like under the scope and what they do, what their function or purpose is in the human body. But with fibroblasts, there's, there's three primary uh, fiber types that are produced by a fibroblast. And I want to take a minute and go through those. Uh, the first type is so I'll put that type A here, is what's referred to as a collagen fiber. A collagen fiber. And a collagen fiber is one that is, uh, uh, has a very, what's referred to as high tensile strength. And what that refers to is it's got a, uh, uh, it's, it's not likely to tear. It takes a lot of tension to tear it. Um, the equivalent I would give you as far as if in a fishing sense is this. I don't know how many of you have ever fished, but when you fish, you can buy different pound test lines, right? And Josh, let me ask you this. Have you, do you fish at all? Okay. But let me ask you this. If you were going to go fishing for muskies, right, what pound test might you use? Yeah, heavy, heavy test pound line, like 20, 25 pound test line, 30 pound test line. And it's very, very strong. It's hard to break it, OK? Um, this is what collagen's like. It's very, very strong. The second type are elastic fibers. And elastic fibers are very elastic but have poor strength. You know, if you're going to go trout fishing around southeast Minnesota, you'll use two-pound test line, two-pound. It's very, very thin. You can cast it very easily. You know, it's very rare to catch a, a two or three pound trout, at least in my case. Um, and the, the line is very flimsy. It's easy to cast. It's hard for the fish to see it. And so it works great for the trout fishing in the, the waters of southeast Minnesota and the rivers and creeks and streams. But it's not real strong. You wouldn't use two pound test line when you go for musky fishing. And then the third type is what's referred to as a reticular fiber. And a reticular fiber is a very branched fiber that's fairly strong. Um, collagen fibers tend to run in parallel bundles, generally. These tend to branch and again be fairly strong. Where you find, um, and I'll give you an example of the difference between collagen and elastic, um, is this. Uh, you have in your nose, um, there's what's referred to as hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage in the nose has a lot of collagen fibers, so it tends not to give a lot. You can't take, and I'm not going to do this, uh, put your nose, the tip of your nose, against your cheek. All right, it's, it's held in place pretty well. However, if you take the ear, uh, on your ear you have a lot of elastic cartilage. There's a lot of elastic fibers, so you can take the ear and bend it um, twist it and so forth, and it gives a lot. Okay, there's a lot of flexibility there, and it bounces back into shape. You can't do that with your nose. Collagen here, elastic fibers here. That's a that's a key difference between the two. All right. Now another big difference between uh, connective tissues, as we 
kind of wrap things up and bring things to a close here today is the degree of vascularity uh, in the tissue. And let me give you an example. Um, ligaments are made up of what's referred to as dense, regular, connective tissue, all right? Bone, like your femur, is bone is also a connective tissue. Now, Josh, let me ask you this question. Um, let's say today as you're heading out to your car, you slipped and fell down on the ice. Uh, a nice person, a good Samaritan came by and uh, helped you up, and things just didn't feel right in your leg, and you went into the ER and got it checked. Would you rather be told, Josh, that you tore your ACL or you broke your femur? You'd rather break your femur, and that's right. And what happens, bone tissue is vascular, and it will heal, you know, it might take five, six weeks, but it will heal and heal completely, and it, you know, you really won't notice that, you know, a year from now you won't notice there was ever a break in your leg. Ligaments have very poor vascularity. Now, barring Mr. Superman, Adrian Peterson, um, most people, when they tear their ACL, that usually is a nine-month healing process, eight to nine months. Uh, you know, he's, he's incredible as far as how he healed and what he was able to do this year for the Vikings. But um, very poor vascularity in the ligaments, so they take quite a, mu a significantly much longer period of time for those things to heal up, all right? Now, um, what I'm planning to do, I'm gonna going to go into detail uh, in class when we meet this week on the different uh, specific types of connective tissue. So I would encourage you to read through chapter four. Uh, we'll be covering connective tissue and also nervous tissue uh, when we meet in the, class, in the classroom. We'll see you then. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.